welcome. Uh, we're here to here to talk through uh, some of the uh, some of the things we've learned and uh, and and some of our findings uh, as we went through and partnered with Wakefield and Kroll pulled together um, a really neat survey and kind of study on the state of incident response. So we're going to talk through today uh, how to build and prepare for incidents um, and how to steer your IR program um, in the direction of excellence. Right, and so I think hopefully we've. Uh, Got some topics and some perspectives from a bunch of folks here um, that I think you'll find you'll find really useful. Uh, whether you're just getting started uh, with incident response, just getting your program off the ground, um, or if you already have a program and you're looking to mature it. So, uh, without uh, without further delay, we're going to dive right in. A uh, brief administrative bit. So, uh, this will be recorded. Um, we're going to try to get to some questions if we can as we go through here. And so, like, please, if you do have questions, drop them drop them into the chat. Um, We've got uh, an addition to the panelists you're going to meet here in a moment. We've got Adam Machinchi, who's going to be riding herd on questions um, and helping to like just make sure that like, uh, we're engaging in discussion. And if there are things we uh, were able to pull out and kind of talk about, uh, dive deeper into um, as we go through, uh, we'll we'll do our best to do that. So uh, you know, please let Adam know. Um, you know have free discussion, and uh, the things that we don't get through, uh, we'll do our best to address afterwards, um, either in writing. Um, or uh, or directly via follow up. So, uh, going to move right on, and we're going to introduce our illustrious uh, our illustrious panel. Um, so, uh, I'm Keith McCammon. Um I'm just going to try to shepherd us through uh, a, a small number of topics. Again, you know, largely guided by the questions uh, you know you send in ahead of time, things we learned through the survey, and then the stuff that comes up uh, during the discussion. Um, want to allow each of these. Uh, each of our experts here to introduce themselves. And Greg, I'll start with you. And I just ask that each of you just tell us a little bit uh, about who you are, but in particular, um, I think it would be really helpful for our guests to understand like how you, you know, how you work within your organization and your role in the context of incident response in particular. Yeah, so yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Greg Bailey, Director of Incident Handling. Um, also happen to be a, a SANS instructor. So a recovering red teamer, if you will. So I, I, I currently, you know, when we work with our customers, especially when it comes to incident response, you know, one of the first things we do is ask them, you know, hey, you know, if something bad happens, what do you do? Right. And so we kick off that conversation with them because honestly, stuff comes up for us. We see things in their environment and we need to know what to do. Right. So that's what we do. And, and in the context of uh, incident response, we do it every day, pretty much all day. So <laughs> that's what I do. And that's how kind of we're involved with our customers' incident response um, strategies, if you will. That's awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Adam. So, uh, you know, protecting Red Canary's customers by protecting Red Canary, like to talk to us. That's the tagline. <laughs> so I'm Adam Mathis. Uh, I run our InfoSec department. Um, and so in the context of incident response, we are both the custodians of the information security policies to include incident management, um, as well as active participants in, uh, in response for uh, response activities for operational and security incidents, um, trying to keep everybody safe. So that's me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, uh, so, uh, you know, keeping our shared customers safe by helping them respond to the worst of the worst. Uh, like, tell, tell us what you do, Mark. What would you say you do here? That's right. We're trying to keep it keep it all together. Um, yeah, my, my world is uh, steeped in incident response and investigations uh, over the last 20 years. I think I, I cut my teeth over 20 years ago on what was then the largest uh, credit card breach at the time um, and, and have found myself in all sorts of fun uh, scenarios around the world. Um, today, I, I, I help lead our uh, incident response team that's responsible for, for ongoing response work for our managed uh, and long-term clients, um, and um, have had the pleasure of, of working with Keith and, and the Red Canary team the last several years as well, and uh, hopefully have a little insight and anecdotes to share along the way that might be beneficial. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for your partnership. And uh, yeah, like, so I, I would say like, you know, before we move on, um, I think we've, we've got just such a unique cross section of like folks and experiences and, uh, you know, e each of these gentlemen uh, working in incident response, you know, day in, day out, but albeit in different ways. So, um, 
you know, really hopeful that kind of that aim, like that guides our discussion uh, and, and lends to some unique perspectives for you all. So, so diving right in. Uh, so this, you know, we, we commissioned a study uh, through Wakefield. So we went out and we surveyed, you know, hundreds of security practitioners and we're really interested in getting our heads wrapped around, um, you know, A, like how do people think about IR? Do they think about IR, IR at all? Like incident response from an organizational perspective. Um, and then, you know, what are the areas in there where like they feel really strong, they feel like they've got room to improve. Um, and so fascinating results, like, you know, a, a, this is really like a, a subset of what we learned. Um, but uh, wanted to start by just kind of talking through, you know, like Mark, maybe invite you to, to just share with us, you know, like, why is this the thing we felt like we needed to, you know, go survey people, learn about, um, and, like commission this study in the first place? Like what, what kind of, what was the genesis of this? And like, why do you feel like it's so important? I, I just think, you know, we're really at an inflection point in the industry, especially the last last couple of years. I mean, looking back over my career and its response, you know, we, we've had this culmination of things like ransomware uh, that's really driven uh, a lot of uh, heartburn and, and, and deep thinking in organizations about how better to prepare for something like that. Um, you know, we've had the global pandemic the last year and a half or so almost that um, has really changed the way we work and and also created incidents of its own. And, and you know, and, and just having been a, a, a practitioner and, and someone in charge of, a, of an, a corporate incident response team at a Fortune 200 for a long time, you know, it's so helpful just to get a sense of like, what are your peers doing? What, how are other people wrestling with this same problem uh, that, uh, that I'm trying to deal with and get my, get my arms around. And so I think, you know, we, we tried really hard to ask some really good and probing questions to kind of, to really provide some valuable insight. And I, I think, I think some of the statistics bear that out. I mean, it's, it's an, it's a challenge that we're all facing and continue to face. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, I appreciate that. And that's, uh, I, I'm looking at the, uh, you yeah, know, the results of the poll. Um, so, you know, we've already surveyed hundreds of folks, uh, maybe a subset of you who are involved in this are here. Um, but that was part of the reason for us wanting to just gauge on the way in here, right? Like, uh, you know, do you feel like this is a, a big company priority um, and that the company is aligned behind like, the purpose of incident response? Um, is it really like a team thing? And I think most commonly, you know, in, in our world, IR tends to be looked at, you know, entirely as a security thing. Um, and, uh and then lastly, you know, is this a thing that you're just getting off the ground? And like, I'm glad you, you know, I'm glad you mentioned COVID in there, right? Because that is like, we're going to talk through um, a lot of the information security specific like perspectives as it relates to IR. But, uh, you know, maybe, you know, as one thing just to start to think about as we go through this discussion, that like incident response and the act of like managing incidents really is a, is a business priority. And that's, you know, that's one of the things that it's a key theme here that we'll kind of talk through Um and you think through, you know, thinking about COVID and how we handled that at Red Canary. I mean, that was a business impacting incident that involved every part of the company, right? Um, just to figure out how to respond to that, when we should respond to that, and what we should do. And I know everyone here has been dealing with that in their own way. So, um, so yeah, I, the the numbers are up here, right? And like these these things that we pulled out were ones that you know we thought were really like uniquely suited to kind of digging in and talking about when we when we kind of frame like what IR is and why it's important and then kind of move through to how you got to build and mature a program. Um, so really like we'd love to open it up, you know, to the three of you just, you know, seeing what's on the screen um, and, you know, understanding what you know, the rest of the report and the conversations and the work you do day in, day out um, open-ended, right? Like what, what jumps out to you in here? Like, so Greg, I'll put you on the spot. Uh, you get to go first, right? Like when you stare at these numbers, like what's surprising, what's not. I, you know, I don't know if any of it's surprising, and I think it's reflected in the the poll that we've done here too. Um, it's almost split down the middle, where you know, IR being a, a company level priority, or just a a team. And I, the first one there too, forty one percent looks like they're even tested regularly. Which, yeah, I mean, there's some some uh, real mature organizations out there that can do that. Um, and then on the other, on the flip side, right, you have team level priority. Um, but they're only used or understood in isolation, right? And to me, that's that's feels like the norm, or at least from my experience. And so it kind of matches our own uh, that you know 
less than half of organizations are unable to contain a threat in less than an hour after that initial compromise. And the first thing that pops into my head is, man, that could be too late. You know, that could just be too late. And, um, you know, I know in the past we've, we've talked about this, um, concept of like moving laterally, right? How quickly does a threat actor move laterally in an organization? And it's right there, right? Under two hours or, or something like that. It's probably gotten faster nowadays, but we know ransomware moves incredibly fast. And so that's frightening to me. That's the first kind of um, statistic that, that frightens me. And I think that's why when we sit down and we talk to our customers, and again, like right off the bat, we'll say, what do we do? What do we do when we see an incident like this that you need to get contacted um, for? And, you know, we, it's funny because as you know, Keith, you can put it in, in kind of some notes in the portal. Like this is our IR plan. This is what we do. This is who should be contacted first and that, that whole call tree and those kind of things. But every once in a while, we'll see one that just says, uh, run, <laughs> you know, like that's, that is, I unfortunately, I think some people's IR plan, some organizations IR plan, and you know, I don't, I don't know if it's a, it's, it's for lack of of um, planning or effort. I think it takes some nuance to actually plan this and to do exactly what you know, forty one percent of our of our pollsters here responded with was test it regularly and test it efficiently. And what does that even mean? You know, and I'll go back all the way to the beginning and say, well, how do you define an incident? That's, I mean, that's the first and foremost, like, what does that mean? Because we've gotten in situations where we see something and we're, we're sitting there talking and, you know, all my team, we tend to see a lot of different things. So even our bar tends to get a little high. We're like, well, I mean, this is bad, but you know, how bad is it? You know, but so that should be very, very well defined right off the bat especially when you're in a high stress situation and you're trying to respond to something, you know, take the human out of it and just kind of go, okay, this is exactly what an incident is. And honestly, erring on the side of caution, I don't think anybody's going to be too upset, right? If they get that call or that, that page that didn't turn out to be too bad, right? I'd rather err on that side of caution. So a little long-winded answer, but that 46% makes sense, stands out. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a glass half full guy. Like I was actually, uh, I will say like, um, I'm, I'm worried about the 46%. I was, you know, I, I was, uh, um, heartened to see that there's 54% who, who feel like they're in good shape, which is great. Right. I do, you know, I think back to reading like the first DBIR, how many years ago and, mm -hmm. you know, the average time to detect anything was up in the, you know, the order of months and, uh, you know, like whether, whether or not threats have evolved and like and kind of change that calculus is, is a, is a good debate to have, but uh, yeah, that's, that's a really interesting one. The um, yeah, Adam, what do you, uh, what, what, what stands out to you? All of them. Um, <laughs> definitely the first one, um, the inability to, to contain a threat in less than an hour after initial compromise. Um, I'm surprised that so many can, honestly, it's a, it's a, um, I'm, I would, I would wonder how many of them could detect detect the com the compromise within an hour and and uh, actually put together um, a response. Um, that I think that kind of drives home one of the things we're talking about today, which is just like how important it is to have an incident response program um, because the thing that helps you get that time down is is muscle memory. It's just going through those things over and over again. Um, and having a plan and knowing what to do next instead of like, it's a very emotional thing. And so a lot of people will tend to freak out in the moment and not know who to call or, or call way too many people. And then you end up with a totally different problem. Um, but that one, that one stood out to me as well. Appreciate that. Mark, how about you? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, as, as someone that's on the other end of the phone, you know, all the time with customers calling, you know, with an incident, you know, typically it's, you know, three o'clock on a Friday afternoon and, and you find out that, you know, the business has been wrestling with something going on for, for hours or even days during the course of the week. And it was only, you know, by the end of the week and people go, wait a minute, it's coming up on the weekend. Maybe I should, you know, escalate this, um, that, that you find out, well, wait a minute, there, there actually is something to this. And, that, and that's really not the first time you want to be getting to know your corporate counsel or your outside counsel. Um, 
and or, you know, an IR partner. Uh, so, you know, figuring out, as you said, Greg, when, when, do you, when do you have an actual incident? And as practitioners, we, we confuse that word incident a lot, I think, because um, that, that can mean a lot of things. You know, it can be an event in your, in your SIM or in your EDR or it's, you know, truly like, hey, this means we've escalated this to a team or to the next level in our organization. And so thinking about what that means when you pick up the phone and, and how quickly you do that. You know, we've, we've been, you know, I've been privileged to, to sit inside of incidents at other security companies at, at places all around the world. And I think, um, you know, I've seen great teams with great resources and, and they, they found something interesting quickly. They were on top of it um, to identify it and even escalate it, but they weren't quite sure how to get it fully contained and remediated. And, you know, by the next morning they were ransomed or, um, you know, maybe the data was there, the alert was there, but they, they just weren't quite certain that it was a problem. Maybe they overlooked it. You know, there's so many different ways you can think about, you know, that issue, but, but just being prepared and thinking about the what ifs of how this goes along and, um, I think the statistics bear that out. You know, we, we're, we're inundated with alerts. We've got a lot to pay attention to. How do you find that signal in the noise? How do you trust that, that you've got something and when to, when to bubble that up? And, and, as, and as it's been the case my entire career, that's, that's, that's a huge challenge and continues to be. Um, yeah, I, th I think the, the, the fortunate thing now is, you know, business leaders, your, your, your legal team, your HR, your C-suite, you know, they, the, the idea of incident response, the idea of what we do has, has become something that's much more known. It's visible. There's resources out there. So you're not, you don't have to just be the, the technical person that's, you know, trying to get the attention of the business. They, they, there's some awareness to this. And then it's just a matter of bringing that together. Yeah, that, that's awesome perspective. I appreciate that. And the, um, you know, you mentioned, um, Actually, I, I do want to take, uh, there was one question that, that came through and I know we've got it, we've got a number of them. Um, but one, I think that's like, that's really relevant because I think, you know, Mark, you just kind of alluded to it, which is like, you know, how do you know you have an incident in the first place? And I, I remember when we were kind of looking at these, you know, this, these numbers early on, um, those left two numbers, right? Like being able to contain these things, but like looking at the, you know, looking at the the middle number, right? Which is that, you know, just the number of alerts that folks deal with every day, like, First, there is the act of just figuring out which of those hundred things like is the one that you need to stop and deal with. And then think, you know, understanding what do you call that thing? How do you prioritize when there are multiple? Um, so I think even just kind of taking a second and just defining what an incident is, is, uh, is like a, is worthwhile. And so like I got, I kind of always, uh, I always steal from PagerDuty who I feel like has like really great, do you know, documentation, but it's, you know, we kind of tend to think of it as, uh, you know, uh, an unplanned, um, an unplanned disruption, right? Uh, something that negatively affects the business or customers. And so, um, you know, as we kind of led in with, the, like, they're not all security related. You can have privacy privacy incidents. You can have financial incidents. You can have human resources incidents. Um, so, you know, maybe we'll transition through and just again, kind of like, you know, would love to keep that in mind um, as we go through and, you know. We tend to be, uh, you know, we're InfoSec practitioners here uh, by and large, but, uh, you know, we all deal with uh, in a variety of ways, like incidents of, of all types, right? So um, it's an interesting, interesting thought experiment to go through and just think about how you define that and like what names you give to things in the first place. Words matter. Yeah, words matter. <laughs> um, so transitioning right uh we wanted to you know one of the things we really wanted to spend some time on is like what are the key components um of a really like a high functioning ir program right and um and then you know we'll kind of get into you know, as we go like how do you take the first steps towards building that and like what do you what should you look at as you mature but uh want to start by just kind of thinking you know looking at this model and just trying to get our heads wrapped around you know you have policy really high level, you have planning, right? So that is like, what are we going to do when there is an incident? And then you've got, you know, your, your procedures, right? Like, and those are sometimes like more specific to an incident or a class of incident. Um, but I want to start at the top, right? And so, uh, you know, Adam, I remember fondly, like when, uh, you know, you were kind of putting this stuff in place at Red Canary for the first time, right? Which was, you know, really leading with a business discussion of like, you know, what are, what, how are we going to define an incident and like, you know, how should we prepare as a company? Um, 
So why don't we just kind of lead off here and just like let you take us through that that policy bit, right? Like how did you approach that conversation? How do you think about the scope of, of policy as it relates to incident response and like what should people look out for? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, so starting off, I kind of liken writing incident like policies and plans to writing a will, which is like everyone kind of agrees that it's a really like useful thing to have and you should absolutely have one, uh, but nobody really likes writing them because it makes you kind of face your own mortality. Uh, it's facing something that's bad that's going to happen to you at some point. Um, so it's it's maybe one of the least fun ones to do uh, when you're building a security program. Um, but kind of starting off, um, at least for me, looking around and seeing like, what are we doing? Like, how are we handling incidents today? Are we handling incidents today? What, where, you know, what's working well? What's working? What's not working so well? Where do we have gaps? So you start like putting together um, this kind of governance because at the end of the day, like your policy, the pol policy parts of your incident response plan or your incident response program are mostly focused on how do you keep um, how do you keep alignment across incidents? Like, you know, Keith mentioned, there's so many different kinds of incident categories you might find yourself in. And so making sure that we have consistent nomenclature so that people know like what an incident is, what classifies as an incident, um, knowing that when we talk about a specific role or a specific item, um, that language is consistent across the board. Um, understanding incident classification and severity. Um, so, you know, everyone is kind of on the same page. You know, if we're talking about something being a SEV1 incident, like that has very clear ramifications across the board. Um, just because you don't like that something isn't working exactly right does not mean that you escalate it up to the top. That has, <laughs> that has a very different uh, meaning in the incident channel. Um, defining all your roles is super important, like knowing who is responsible for what. Um, knowing who is allowed to talk to the press or knowing when to engage your leadership, knowing when to, um, when to engage your outside counsel, uh, your outside partners, um, all of that stuff, cyber insurance, like a call tree of who to call, all of those things um, you don't necessarily have in your clear mind uh, in the midst of a crisis. Um, so having this policy means that when you get into the operational planning um, you have some some guidelines and some guardrails to say like, hey, these are all of the components that you need to be planning for. Um, because, you know, as InfoSec, uh, you can't do all of it. Like you're not, you're not going to be in every single incident. Um, there's going to be a lot of operational incidents. There's going to be security incidents that like may involve parts of your team, um, but maybe, you know, smaller in scale. And so you want all of these things to be very consistent because that's how you get your metrics. That's how you, you get good reporting, um, you know, to your leadership, to your board. Um, that's how you know you're getting better. Um, all of those things are really important to define um, kind of in the beginning. And so putting those things together, there was a lot of iteration. <laughs> so um, there's, because incident response covers the whole business. Like it's, it's you know, any part of the business can have uh, an incident occur. And so you have to have, you have to have buy-in from all your stakeholders across the business and they have to agree on these things. So they have to agree on the language. They have to agree on the classifications and severity um, because you don't want to, you don't want to have a bunch of inconsistent processes. Uh, when people get into planning, you don't want your operational team using completely different communications channels, you know, than your security team. Um, you might need to retain some of that. You might not have all the right controls in place. Um, so as as not fun um, <laughs> as not fun as it might be to kind of go through the policy writing, um, it was super instructive uh, to me, just kind of like iterating through it, talking to leadership, um, and coming together. And it, you do get that like nice, like, ha, ah, we have we have something in place. We have something in place that we can turn to. Um, and of course, just like any other security policy like you you understand when you build it that you are going to iterate on it because you're going to find things um, as you go through incidents that are going to instruct you on how to how to improve it how to refine it how to make it uh how to make it better um and so that that's how that's how i approached it anyway yeah i i, I definitely love that, that theme of alignment right which is just you know who who should be communicating with whom and when and like you know to, to one of the points that came up previously like there, there are some parts of that where it's like, who should not be communicating or who should you not communicate with unless it's under really specific circumstances. And right. uh, 
like just having those guardrails in place. I know like, in, you know, it, it is like, it's, it's emotionally charged. You usually have incomplete information, right? And so you're, you know, you're really kind of, you're almost always operating at like this weird disadvantage, uh, kind of think of like jujitsu, right? It's like fighting on your back and like, you can either just like wait until it happens and then figure out how you're going to, how you're going to get out of that situation, or you can, you know, you can plan for that. And uh, yeah, that's, that's awesome advice. I really appreciate it. Um, and so, you know, Greg, maybe it's like, you know, we'll keep moving down our model, right? Like uh, I, you, you to me are the embodiment, embodiment of operational management, right? Where you do like, you have to talk to customers who like are experiencing that like emotionally charged moment. Uh, you're also helping to deal with operators and there's like just a lot of triage communication going on. Um, from your perspective, like, you know, the big things, like the big, big parts of the plan there, um, like what, what have you found most useful? Like what are the things you find yourself relying on most often? Yeah, I and I think just to go back to and reiterate how important it is to have that leadership buy-in, right? To know that okay, not only are we going to get these policies in place, but we're also going to, you know, hopefully get the resources that we need to then put this into operation, right? So, and what does that mean then to put this thing into operations, right? Well, a couple, I mean, a couple of different things, right? The first thing is that those the the people aspect of it is obviously the hardest part. So you do need, in my opinion, you, you do need people who know the business. That's the most, to my, to kind of, it's like the one piece that I always think about in this context is that, sure, we can, we can kind of react, respond to an incident, to a security problem with our expertise that we've had, you know, and our teams have broad experience across industries, across technologies, across different niches of InfoSec. But ultimately, what we don't have is that deep understanding of how the business operates. So I'm thinking as it of it at from like our perspective as a third party. And so we need those folks. And so that's again what scared me about some of the like very the initial poll, which was, well, it's very team-based and no one really knows about it outside of that. And so having that the people aspect of it. Um, I think is important. And when we've, when I've done this in the past to not just as like a, a, a third party, but as, as a client, as, as a, a, as a large financial institution to say, you know what, we need to walk through um, an incident, right? And, and we didn't, it wasn't a broad, it wasn't a very um, niche type of incident. It was just like, Hey, what would happen if this part of the business was compromised? And, and it kicked off a whole lot of areas that we didn't think of. You know, when we had HR there, we had legal in the room, we had um, network the the network ops folks, we had the infrastructure ops folks, we had the cloud ops folks in. And so, once you get all those people in the room, it can also get very complicated. So all of a sudden, everybody has a piece or is impacted in a way that maybe we didn't understand. So I think having that discussion and making sure that we understand who's impacted and then what processes we can put in place. And that's where I think it starts. Obviously, this is a fluid kind of, well, fluid is probably the wrong word, but it's, it can be a growing and mature type of operation. But certainly there's the, okay, let's start here and it kind of expand out, get the right folks in the room. And then, you know, I see that as the people aspect. Um, and that can get tricky because obviously, in-house folks may not have all the expertise that certain you know folks outside of the organization have. So when do you bring in an expert? When do you bring in a third party? Um, how do you test your plan? So these are all kind of things I'm thinking about from a management perspective. So and that's just the people side of things. Not to mention the technology side, which is do we even have the technology in place to see the thing happening? And I know there was a mention in the chat. Um, about, I think, automated types of, of events or signals, right? And that's one thing, right? We know there's technology out there that can do that. But the other piece of it that I th think they were referring to or inferring to was the behavioral type of stuff. And that's the part where you've got to ask yourself as an organization, do I have the expertise in-house to manage this type of, of maybe nuanced behavior that maybe I only see once in a blue moon, but a third party, maybe they see that a little bit more often and can help me to identify the the signals, if you will, that might help lead 
into that detection capability. So ran the gamut there from people to technology, but, and I, I think even threw in a little process, but you know, I got to throw those three pieces in, I guess. <laughs> the commercial for that model. That's really what we're here to do. The, um, no, like, so it, you know, you do like you kind of hit on the fact, and I'm really glad you brought up testing. I actually would love to spend a second talking about that in particular, right? Because I think, you know, Absolutely. you know, as Adam mentioned, like policy kind of like sets this huge stage for like, you know, when does this going to happen? Like, how is it important? When is it important? What are the major like activities? And really, like, a lot of it's like who's authorized to do them. Um, it's really like this foundational like business plumbing that has to be in place, right? Um, and like planning and procedures kind of like, it, you know, these things are all super closely coupled, but it seems like as we get into the end, like I'm glad you mentioned testing this stuff because I think it was Adam mentioned earlier, like IR is kind of like a muscle, right? And like the act of kind of going through and drilling, like the reason that you train for emergencies and the reason that firefighters start fires and put them out on purpose is like, so that when, you know, when that happens, uh, you know, in real life, you're not, you're not trying to figure out all the stuff on the fly. Um, so we'd love to kind of dig in and talk through that concept of just, you know, like putting a scenario out there and just figuring out, you know, even if it's just talking, like talking through how you'd respond, um, you know, Mark, uh, kind of looking at this list over on the right, right, which is kind of a laundry list of not, definitely not exhaustive, but like probably still too many places you have to think about involving every time something goes sideways, Um would love to like bring in the context of like testing and preparation. Would love to just take a second and kind of talk through, you know, what you see and like when you walk into, you know, like, you all do hundreds, probably thousands of these a year, right? Like, do you see a difference when you walk in the door? Like, can you tell the difference between a team that's done these things on the left and that tests them and the team that doesn't? And like, you like, what does that mean for them? Like, once you show up, like, how does that affect the response or your effectiveness as a team? Yeah. You can, you know, I've, I've been in those organizations and, you know, and, and, and for us, you know, we, we run tabletop exercises for clients um, and, and we've been in those situations where we know the client went through an exercise and then, you know, unfortunately, you know, a few weeks or months later, they had a pretty significant incident and, and we've been in, we've, we've been able to have those conversations and learn like, yeah, it's really beneficial. And you find out that, you know, certainly you can't, you can't, fathom every single incident and, and nor does your plan need to cover everything. I think that's an important piece of this too, is start simple. Um, you know, the, the basic understanding who those stakeholders are, building those initial relationships, knowing who you're going to call, you know, as a practitioner, I'm, I'm a problem solver, right? I want to try to figure this out myself. I want to try to get this thing contained and make it go away. But you realize that there, there's a lot of valuable uh, considerations and, and stakeholders in the business that are thinking about things that you're probably not thinking about. And so being able to run through those exercises, you know, ferret out some of those uh, details and what's important to your business. And every business is a little different. You've got different regulatory concerns. You've got different client potential contractual concerns, depending on what you do. And to make sure those are built into your thinking uh, is, is really important. And that's, you know, it's not a technical question. That's a business and, and operations question. And, um, you know, pulling all that to, uh, together and going through that in, in a scenario is, is tremendously invaluable. If you haven't had the opportunity to do that, I would highly encourage you to, to, to seek that out and, and find a way to do that. Even if you just have to do it internally and, and build out your own scenarios, that's great. Or, or bring in somebody to help that's, that's done it a lot. And there's some weird caveat. I mean, I would add to, and in, in, uh, if you don't mind me, just add some context to that is, first of all, testing to me, that's my eyes light up because, you know, for, as a former, you know, kind of red team operator, that was my jam was, was okay, what do we need to test? And, and the conversations that we used to have wasn't like, this is going to be a cool hack, but it was, all right, what is important to the organization in that business context? And what is the whole point of what we're trying to do? And the whole point of what we were trying to do was to show that impact and then determine if the detection capability was there, right? Because I think to go back to that old world is, is super important. And you know, from, from me and my team on a daily basis, we immediately dig into telemetry, but you know, there are times when it's not there. And, and it could be, you know, could be any number of reasons why. Um, but these scenarios are key. And I think the one caveat is 
don't go too deep right away. Don't like, you know, it's not like, well, okay, here's APT 29. I got to, they, you know, use these TTPs. I'm going to kind of mimic this adversary. Start, start with, Hey, this is our business. Ask the business, right? Like, what is your big concern? What, what is your biggest concern? If something you show up at night. Yeah. And, yeah. and they'll tell you, and then it's like, okay, well, let's sit down then and discuss exactly what steps you would take to address that. Right. So that's my, that's, that's my enthusiastic response to Mark. That's awesome stuff. You, you get the call. I mean, law enforcement is on there, right? I mean, like, like the situation you don't want to be in is you get the phone call from your local, you know, FBI field office that says, Hey, we have reason to believe that, you know, some of your data is leaking out somewhere, you know, and, and they're not going to tell you exactly how they know. And they're not going to give you all the details because that might reveal, you know, some inside information that they can't jeopardize, but you got to take that call seriously. And, and, and what happens is you'll find out, oh, I didn't know that we had this system over here that does this certain thing for the business. And exactly to your point, then to start peeling back that onion to, sil- to just be able to solve that question of like, okay, yeah, do we have a problem? Means you've got to ask, well, ultimately, do we have the logs? Do we have the audit trail? Do we have the systems in place to go answer that question about that particular system? And, and oftentimes you find out, well, maybe we do a little bit, or maybe we have this thing, but you know, it's, one we run into a lot is IP address, um, uh, you know, not hiding the IP address through a proxy. Like, oh yeah, we've got this website. Oh, but wait a minute, all of our logs show the the VIP IP um, and not the actual attacker IP. So now we've got to go through this whole exercise to try to 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 understand that, and that that takes time and money, and sometimes can't be done. Uh, so to just envisioning those scenarios and then playing that through can can help ferret out some of those weaknesses pretty easily. So actually, I want to want to talk through more a little bit more about that, right? Because we there are you know if you kind of just looking at the left hand side and then like all these people, all the stakeholders you have to keep involved, right? There, um, I think they're recurring. Like there's a there's a lot of jobs to be done, right? Like there just there are, right? There's um, there's the really high level coordination. There's the technical response. There's the legal side. Like there's there's a whole bunch of that, and you know one of the ways that um, I mean, I think one of the things like I've been most thankful for, for like working with Kroll over the years and I, we all have is just like, um, you can't get good at all this stuff. Like you just cannot, like, like there's, you know, the security 1% kind of like, uh, you know, that way of thinking, which is that like, there's a very, you know, whether you subscribe to that or not, but like, there's a very small percentage of organizations that can implement like full on security operations program, keeping in mind like incident response is just one part of that, right? Like you've got threat intelligence, like you have detection, you have the initial investigation. Eventually you get to the point where you do incident response, which is what we're here to talk about. But like, you know, when you zoom all the way out to like enterprise risk management, like this is one of 20 like big operational problems and things you need to go through. So um, yeah, we'd love to kind of dig into, you know, how we kind of, like how you each think about the partnership aspect of that and how you decide, um, you know, maybe Adam just like, you know, going right at you, like, how do you decide what your team is going to do? Like, what are you going to build yourself from the ground up? And then like, where do you look to, you know, where do you look to, you know, your service providers, the products, solutions you acquire? Like, how do you, how do you figure out how to balance that? And like, maybe, you know, what's, what's a good framework for people to think through that? Like specific to incidents? Sure. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. One of the things that I, I really liked, um, I really liked about the previous conversation is like the testing aspect and, and like table topping and stuff like that. Um, I, and I think that that helps uncover some of your deficiencies or some places where you do need to, um, where you do need to add to your stack. Um, because you're going to find like, it's like, okay, well, what are we going to do now? It's like, well, we're going to, Oh, we don't have anything there. <laughs> and you're now all of a sudden it's like, okay, is that something we need to build? Like, what's the risk to us if we run into that situation and incident? Um, and one of the things that I think is, has been really useful in helping, like, help our team level that up is doing kind of more atomic incident response tabletops. So instead of like getting everybody together in a room and saying like, we're gonna have we're gonna have like a full blown exercise like from start to finish. That's super useful, but um, it's also useful to say like, 
all right, we know what our most sensitive data is. What if we found that somebody was accessing it incorrectly? Like, what do we do? And then like, you just take a little part of it and then say like, okay, well, this is how we would know, like, okay, prove it. How do we, do we have those access logs? Like, okay, well, this is what we would do to lock it down. Um, that, that just, it, it builds some of that muscle memory um, and, and kind of helps you uh, with that. But there's always like, you know, as been said, the kind of incidents you prepare for are not always going to be the incidents you walk into. So like if we exhaust this metaphor to death and we talk about incident response as a muscle, like you might be spending all your day, like curling and bench press. Um, but then you might come down to it and you need somebody that can deadlift. <laughs> so that's where, that's where the crawls come in. Like, because they fight, you know, they fight evil all day, every day. And like some of the, the worst on the planet. And so, um, you know, not doing, full-time incident response 24 seven um you're going to need someone in the trench with you that can help um lift you up and and show you like what's the next best thing to do and it'll help your team get better too um you'll learn by working with them and i like to, I like I, to think I, of the oh go ahead mark go ahead. Yeah, I, like I, just, the... I just tossed this chart up here because like i know like just kind of talking through the delivery models for that right there's like you tend to have a customer like Customers or organizations where, um, you know, they partner with, some, and I think it was what, like thinking back to those stats, right? Like 80, 82% or 80 some percent of folks are going to partner in some way on this. And so, um, you know, thinking about what that looks like is important. And like, part of it is just like, you know, is what you need turnkey kind of security operations. Do you already have that? And what you want is to like, you really want, like you want someone who gives you a lot of confidence in your ability to go respond to a major incident, right? Do you want to augment the team that you have? Um, and it seems like you know, you know, half or half or more of the folks here are, are sound, seem like you're probably in that area, right? Where you're trying to figure out how to level up. So yeah, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, I'd love your perspective on this, but like, in particular, just like benefits of partnership and how people can approach that and get value. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I like to think of it as sort of the medical analogy for me is, um, you know, I've got. I have a good friend that's a head of trauma surgery in the local hospital, right? And so there, there's the kind of wounds that would happen to me that's like, you know what? I'm not going to try to patch this up myself. I'm going to pick up the phone and call uh, call the surgeon and, and go show up at the emergency room. And, and, and maybe there's something that's less serious that, you know, I've got an in-house doctor or my, you know, my, my sister-in-law is a nurse or I've, I've got... Uh, certain things I can take care of myself, but I still know, you know, at some point, I'm probably not going to have the in-house expertise to to take care of that myself. And where is that point for our organization? And and truly, you know, for, for some scenarios, you may legally need to have that outside opinion. You might need some outside help anyway, even if you have a full-fledged, you know, IR team and capability in-house, you know, the, those, those situations do come up. You, you might have someone in your own security team, if you're big enough, that's the subject of an incident. So then, what do you do? So those, those scenarios do come up, um, but finding that 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 um, sweet spot for your company and knowing, like, hey, we need some help with this. Like, yeah, we need help with the monitoring and the detection and the validation. Um, because guess what? It's hard to find good people to do that. It's it's takes a lot of expertise and and awareness. And and I think that's truly what we bring to the table. Um, you know, for for being in the IR trenches all the time, we sort of see all those scenarios play out and that really helps us refine our detection, identification, and then the response capability uh, in a way that you just, you just can't completely get if you're doing this on your own. Um, you know, the, you just cannot do the same thing that a trauma surgeon would and, and be able to see, see that kind of um, issue every day of the week and, and know exactly what to do. So finding where you are on that spectrum and what you need uh, is really important. It's a good way to think about it. And don't be the hero, right? No, I, I think there's, as you said, Keith, you know, we, no one person knows everything about the space. Uh, threats are constantly evolving. There's different types of incidents. And so you're going to, you're going to need and, and, and be well advised to have those resources at the ready um, when you need them. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you hit on another great point, which is, you know, at, you know, in under, you know, our organization, we have the Intel folks, we've got folks like uh, uh, Katie and Matt who are doing, you know, all of that research that allow us to respond the way we can, you know, they do, do you have in folks or does your organization have the resources to kind of do what they do day in, day out teams of people who are doing that type of uh, work. Um, and then the detection tuning, 
right? Coming up with those. And, and I think I mentioned earlier the behavioral type of, of activities that are hard to detect from a telemetry perspective. So the folks, that kind of circle of operations from, from threat research into that detection creation, detection engineering piece, and then your operators, right? It's that constant circle of feedback loops that enable us to uh, elevate that level you know, as much as we can. To Mark's point, it's that expertise of seeing these things over and over and over and understanding how they work and seeing you know, just odd behavior and or stuff that we can dig into and rip apart. It's part of, of, of what we do, right? So I think that's where we do, we can bring in those, those experts for sure. There was a question about playbooks, I think, in the chat. I mean, I think, you know, that's a great example of, you know, your mileage may vary based on your company, but, um, you know, thinking about uh, one, one good way to think about it might be looking at if you have a disaster recovery plan, you know, if you've already identified in your company, like what are, what are the important pieces of your business? What are the most important systems? You know, a lot of times those may follow that those could also be significant in the event of an incident. And so start to think about what would you do? Who are the stakeholders for, for this particular system or this particular environment and begin to put, put those basic um, flows in place to say, what do we do if we had an issue with the system? Who do we call? And, um, you know, th those, those can be good ways to start. You might already have those resources uh, in, your, in your organization outside of security. Yeah, I, I was actually just keying in on that same question. I, I kind of flipped over here because I think, you know, we'd love to spend you know, the, the 10 or so minutes we have left just kind of digging into like some of these specifics. So I think that's where, um, so playbooks, right? Like we spent a whole bunch of time telling people to like do plans and write things down. And then we turned around and we told them that like the incidents you plan for are not necessarily the incidents you're going to walk into. And so, yeah, how do you reconcile that stuff, right? Because it is like there is, there's definitely a natural tendency um, for a lot of organiz organizations, particularly as you get bigger, right? And like if you're regulated or you have soccer ISO, like you're having to do a bunch of activities in the name of like, you know, maintaining compliance and doing what you say you're going to do. Um, and it's sometimes easy to fall into the trap of saying, yeah, yeah, like we have an IR plan. It's over there. It's on the wall. Like, yeah, we have a playbook for this. It's over there. But then the thing happens, right? So like, um, I don't know, like, at, like so I, I'm, I've always been fascinated by our internal incident response process, right? Because like it is like it's pretty well aligned with how we communicate. But I would love for like, like your perspective and just like, how do you do that, right? So how do you reconcile the fact that like you do have to plan for a bunch of things and you have to do a bunch of structured stuff, but like the, like the incident that you walk into tomorrow, like I'd say call it 50% chance it's one that you don't have a playbook for. Like what, how do you implement that in a way that like ensures that the team's not blocked and everyone's not just like navel gazing, but like you, you all feel confident that you're moving in the right direction. Like how do you, how do, you do that, Red Canary? Yeah. Uh, so one of the one of the things that was actually on like the the first slide with all the um, metrics and stuff or from the polls, um, let's talk about like investing in automation. And so um, I think there's a, a general and I'll, I'll get to your point. Don't worry. <laughs> so um, I think one of the the natural things that a lot of organizations will do is say like let's automate all of the like doing parts of the incident so like let's automate the locking down of systems let's automate like the shutting down of accounts and that stuff's useful um but that's going to vary uh depending on your incident the things that are not going to vary are how you set up your incident how you declare it how you track it um who you involve um there's going to be a little bit of play depending on like which systems there are um but where we where we put a lot of investment in automation is actually setting up the incident and so making it easy for people to declare an incident getting just enough information um so that like whoever's walking into it they, they have the tldr of what to work with um and then giving them tools to um to involve the right people. So um, it's a it, it's a process that we have. It automates the creation of your communications channels, like your Slack channels, your tracking incidents in Jira or GitHub or wherever you might have it. Um, and one of the things that we we include is a link to our playbooks. So right at the top of the Slack channel, when you get started in an incident, it is the playbooks. And the very first one is the overarching like um, incident management playbook. And so it talks through the policy, the procedures um, in kind of a more 
vague way um, in a in a non-specific. Um, but then we also have like very specific like privacy uh, playbooks. Like if there's potentially like customer sensitive data involved, like who do you involve? And that kind of changes. Um, but you know, somebody mentioned in the chat like you know we have all this we have all these playbooks, but like the incident starts and people are just like let's go. Um, and they'll sometimes leave that behind and won't follow it. And so just by putting it front and center, if there's ever any question, they don't have to go look for it. They just say like, I already know what I'm supposed to do next here. Um, and if it's for some reason, not something that we've planned for, they still have all the context they need. They still have the general incident management flow to follow. Um, and, and we've seen a lot of success in, uh, in consistency and how we're measuring incidents and how we're getting better um, after the fact, because, you know, if you're in the middle of an incident, the last thing that you're thinking of doing is like going and creating a tracking incident, like a tracking issue. Like you're not saying like, I need to go document this so that we can have an excellent lessons learned. Um, but that's one of the most valuable things to come out of incidents is like, how do you get better? What have you learned? What didn't work well? What can we do better next time? So this particular incident never happens again. And so setting that stuff up, I, I've seen a lot of seen a lot of value, even if we're not able to plan for every single incident under the sun. It kind of sounds like they're almost like they build on each other. Right. But um, I mm -hmm. think that, you know, that really basic, uh, like, yeah, like who's in charge, right? Like even just right. knowing, Hey, like we've decided we have an incident and just being explicit about, you know, who's, who's in charge of the boots on ground response, who's in charge of communication um inside out yeah internally externally kind of just, you know doesn't maybe matters less than just like being you know really decisive about that stuff up front and i think it's you know even as you just like i'm just looking at this checklist as you're talking right and it's like roles and responsibilities first right and just like but also yeah like putting putting your really generic like your most basic incident management like checklist like right up front right which is like just you know figure these things out, make sure that everyone who's involved, like can see them and knows them um, really important. And the, uh, so, you know, and when there's a ton here, right? Like just again, like looking at this checklist, which is small in comparison to like all the things that you need to, you might be called on to do. Like um, how do you, I don't know. It's like Mark, I'll say like you, you've probably got more like, end-to-end -end, like incident management experience than the rest of us combined, I hope. Um, so the, you know, when, it, what, what are the things, like if you got to pick one or two things like right here that you would recommend people, like where do you see people get the most mileage? When you walk into an organization, they've had a major incident, you show up, um, like if there's just one or two of the things here that like everything like everything goes much smoother if those are like in place and buttoned up like what are they like how do how do people go about doing that? wow yeah and two or three things come to mind i mean the simple thing is you know i think roles and responsibilities so companies that know as you were kind of alluding to like who does the buck stop with who, who's going to be the, the the decision maker when things hit the fan you know is that your inside counsel is that your coo is that your cfo is that your CISO? you know, who in the organization has that responsibility? Um, you know, the organizations that are trying to figure that out in the middle of an incident, you end up with a lot of mixed messages, you're going in different directions, um, and, and that makes things difficult. So at a management level, I think that's, that's key. Um, you know, from a planning perspective, um, you know, knowing your logs, right? So as, as technologists, you know, when we come in and you're like, hey, we've got an incident involving our exchange server. Okay, well, let's see, do you, do you have logs? Do you have uh, retention of that. Do you know where those exist? Uh, are they in your SIM? Are they here? Uh, do you have EDR? Where, you know, what, what is that covered? Does that cover your entire environment? Um, you know, all those kind of just basic questions. You know, years ago, I always said like, back before SIM was much of a thing, it's just like, just have the logs, just turn them on. Like, even if you don't look at them, turn them on so that we have something to go on. And I think um, there's probably still a little bit of truth to that, um, that, that having that information is going to help the investigation. And uh, I think the third thing I would just say is, is for practitioners and, and folks at all levels is, is don't speculate. Um, you know, the worst thing that really can derail an instant response is, is the, the one person who decides that they're, um, you know, have got something figured out or, you know, that you see one technical thing. And instead of just re reporting the facts, it's colored with a lot of, oh, man, I think the sky is falling. I think it's this group or that group or we're being attacked by this. And it's all speculation and that just will throw off, you know, the entire investigation. And so really 
stick to the facts. If you're going to speculate about something, make sure it's very clear that, hey, I'm, I'm just speculating here for the heck of it. But, you know, stick to the facts, know who's in charge and, and know your data sources, I think would be the three most key things I've seen over the years. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, and really the, uh, you know, on the one hand, we say be decisive. But on the other hand, it's like, yeah, you definitely don't want to, uh, you definitely, you know, assumptions can lead you down a, down a dark place, right? And like, that's not where you want to end up. The, uh, so on, you know, Greg, for your part, right? Like you, like you're coming at these at a different level, right? Like, so, you know, whereas I think of Mark's team is doing, you know, um, you're involved with legal and you're involved with PR. You're also doing technical response, right? But, you know, Kroll in general is like, that's like, you're doing like enterprise risk management on the fly in the context of incidents, right? And um, so you're trying to balance all these different things. Uh, you know, your team is kind of diving in like, their job is to make sure that day in, day out, right? These incidents of different severities, like we're helping customers answer questions like, hey, like what should I what should I look for next? And what should I do? Um, like what are you how does your team approach that? And like what are the like what are the one or two things you tell your team, like whether they're technical or otherwise, like how do you what's the guidance you give them when you have someone new and you're like when a like when a bad thing happens, like expect this, go do this. Like how do you how do you get them started to ensure that like for our MDR customers, like they've got the support they need. Yeah. It's interesting because our customers kind of run the gamut, both from very small organizations who may have just one IT person. Um, and that person is not, you know, say, uh, uh, doesn't have a whole lot of experience in InfoSec or, or any kind of security controls or anything like that. So there may be time we have to be flexible. We have to understand our customers' environments. And I think the key to that, um, that how to respond is, is that piece. Knowing what, knowing your environment. And, and, we, and we tell all our instant handlers the same kind of thing. And when, they bring, when we bring new customers on board, we go through this process of, of, of asking them, okay, look, what does your security stack look like? What is you know, what does your incident response plan look like, right? Um, what kind of technologies and telemetry do you have already? Um, and what does your staff look like? And how capable are they, you know, 24-7, how big, how, that kind of thing. And so it's, it's, it's trying to understand the context of that organization so that we can respond in a way that is efficient for them. And so for, it could be a call in the middle of the night. I don't know what to do. I'm the only person here. You know, uh, I've got all these events and, and alerts and detections popping off. What do I do? And so it can be literally, okay, let's start from square one. And our instant handlers will walk them through uh, individual steps. First, do this. Uh, have we identified the problem? Can we contain it? Right. Those are the things. And at some point in that evening, could a lot of them have the middle of the night or Friday afternoons for some reason, is all right. Well, we've gotten you here. It's contained. Right. Take a breath. <laughs> Start over tomorrow with the team of folks who can help you rebuild. We've contained the problem at least at that point. Whereas we have other organizations that come in and say, what do you know about this particular technique or this particular gap in our telemetry? Can help us, you know, walk through that. So it runs the gamut, but it's turning the lights on. It's it's understanding what what we can see and what we cannot see in that organization, and working with in the context of that of that organization. And the great part about part about it, the folks on our team, is that we've been there. We we've been in those small organizations. We've been in those large enterprises. We've we've done the testing. We've we've set up exchange servers and had to manage those. You know, it's, so it's having that kind of expertise to get the right person in the right spot to talk to that organization or that customer so that they can get to that point where they're like, okay, I'm, I'm okay. Now help us after the fact too. And we'll have those conversations too, which is here's what we think, knowing what we know about your environment, where you can improve. Here are some ideas, some strategies that might help you put some more layers in your in your uh, defenses, you know, that kind of conversation is, is important. And it's, so it's getting to know the organization and the customers so that we can help them in that efficient way. And we even do, we get the, the question of, um, do you, can you help us do a tabletop? Sure. Yeah. I mean, absolutely we can, you know, there's, there's several different ways to do this. And so, um, 
that's what we tried to do is be, is be that partner, be that, that friend kind of, you know, and in the middle of the night, when we get those calls, we are that friend really like, Hey, calm down. It's, it's okay. We, we understand the context here. Let's get you to a safe place. So you, you all who've been up for 36 hours can go to bed, <laughs> you know? So that's how I look at it. Uh, I, yeah, I love it. I appreciate that. The, um, and maybe you know, we're, we're at time and I want to be respectful of y'all's time because you've got uh, things like, uh, incidents of different types. I'm sure that uh, you need to go respond to here in the near future, but the, um, but I do, yeah, you know, like maybe just to kind of, to bring this home and like even just, you know, getting back to the beginning, which is that the, you know, this really is starting with policy, right? Like this is very much a incident response is a, it's a business level activity um, and, you know, it impacts cybersecurity, but it can impact lots of other things. And, uh, and I love that, that thread of just like really leading with understanding, you know, what does this organization exist to do, right? Like each of your customers, some like are internal or they're external and like they all, they all have different shapes. But like, uh, I think the thing that most of them have in common is that like, you know, none of them are selling cybersecurity or very few of them are selling cybersecurity as a feature of their business to their end customers, right? And so like they are, they are banks or they're manufacturers or they're healthcare organizations. And so, um, you know, really kind of framing this as a, like as, you know, a business priority first and keeping in mind that like that business is, you know, first duty is to maintain, you know, maintain a level of service to their customers, like incident response just it should flow along with that. Right. So. Awesome. Well, I, uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, again, we are, we are at time, but we've got some more questions. Um, we're going to take these, the ones that we didn't get to today, uh, we're going to try to answer in writing either individually, or maybe we'll put something together for some of those common threads. Um, wanted to take one last moment just to say a huge thank you, Adam, Greg, Mark. Um, I wish we had another hour. We've got questions flowing in about standards and about measurement and like some of the, like the real implementation details. And, uh, I think we were we were optimistic we could get through more in an hour, but I'm like I'm really thankful that uh, you all shared everything that you did, and like maybe we'll do another one of these in the future. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, really appreciate the questions, um, Adam. Thank you for uh, for finding the Q and A over there, and uh, we'll we'll work with everyone after the fact to uh, make sure we're following up. Thank you all very much. Have a have a terrific day. Appreciate it.